All right, we got a new question here. After reading through some of the judgments in Revelation, it seems like it's describing some sort of nuclear holocaust. Is there any other scripture that might fit with this? Well, I'd have to say, yeah, I think so. I, both the Old and the New Testaments actually describe an event that seems to be a nuclear war. In Revelation 9, we read about the third part of mankind being killed by the three plagues of fire, smoke, and sulfur. Zechariah wrote how uh, their flesh shall consume away while they stand on their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Uh, Joel wrote in chapter 2, I think, uh, I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood, fire, and billows of smoke. This appears to be describing a nuclear blast. The, the scriptures actually give quite a detailed description of a judgment of fire that will be sent to earth in the last days. Revelation chapter 8, we see that a third part of the trees are burned up and all the green grass was burned up. We also read about the judgment of the great whore of Babylon, the city that sits on seven hills, and how God will cause the kings of the earth to hate her and consume her with fire until she will be found no more at all forever. The scriptures do seem to have a lot to say about this coming fire judgment. It's, you know, some folks want to only look at some of these prophecies in their spiritual dimensions. Now, I don't argue with sound spiritual interpretations, as they do offer a lot of really good information, but, but I don't want to hyper-spiritualize the scriptures into oblivion either. Now, God gave us these warnings so that we're not caught unawares when this stuff hits the fan. The, the prophet Zechariah in particular describes what seems to be a nuclear exchange in such vivid detail, it's downright scary. He speaks of these flying cylindrical containers that deliver these wicked fire offerings composed of extremely heavy metal, which fly across the face of the whole earth and consume houses and buildings, even the stones thereof. And uh, they, they even leave this residue behind after the destruction. Zachariah even gives the exact dimensions of the delivery vehicles, the size of the containers that hold the wicked fire offerings, and he even details exactly how the heavy metal mechanism of this evil fire offering is detonated. He identifies exactly who is targeted and even why. Now, before we dig into this particular prophecy, we need to review some Hebrew terms. We, we have to remember that Zechariah had this vision 2,500 years ago and wrote down what he saw the best he could in a language that most of us today don't speak. Unfortunately, sometimes when we read these things in a straight modern English, we have a hard time deciphering exactly what's going on. Th this is a place where a good translation of the Old Testament really shines over our modernized and paraphrased versions that we have, commonplace in America now. I I'm going to be looking up the original Hebrew words in this text using a Strong's Concordance with the Hebrew lexicon. And you can all follow along with me. You can get it for free online, or you can buy one at the bookstore. They're not impossible to find. Now, this particular prophecy I'm talking about is found in Zechariah chapter 5. Now, if you read Zechariah chapter 5 using a modern English paraphrase Bible without checking the Hebrew, you're going to be very confused. You are going to be reading about this woman that is so evil that she's crammed into a wicker basket, and nothing is really going to make sense. But we're not going to do that here. We're just going to read exactly what Zechariah says in the Hebrew language. We're not going to creatively spiritualize it away until it doesn't make any sense. You know, unfortunately, many commentaries have kind of done that on this particular passage. So let's uh, review some, some of our Hebrew first, and then we'll read what Zechariah wrote back in like 520 B.C. The first thing that Zechariah sees in this vision is this giant flying roll. Now, what is a roll? Some Bibles say scroll, but the word here is Megillah. Not a scroll like we commonly think that rolls up into the two cylinders. Uh, Torah is written on a scroll rolled up into the two cylinders. Now, a Megillah rolls up into a single cylinder. For example, the book of Esther is on a Megillah. 
and rolls up into a single roll. You can see here a Megillah is pretty much a, a cylinder and typically has this uh, common 2 to 1 height to circumference ratio. Zachariah gives the size of this Megillah that he sees flying through the air. He says that it's 20 cubits high and 10 cubits in breadth. Now the word breadth here is not diameter. Diameter is a Greek measurement. The breadth Zachariah is talking about here is what they call a line cast about. We would call it circumference. Like uh, back in, I think it's uh, First Kings maybe, King Solomon was building his house with these giant pillars, 30 cubits in breadth. This was the line cast about, not diameter. They weren't 30 cubits in diameter. Uh, to find the diameter of a cylinder, if you want to know how big this flying megillah was, Zachariah describes, you have to take the breadth and divide it by pi. The megillah Zachariah saw here was uh, 20 cubits high and 10 cubits in breadth, or line cast about. That comes out to be approximately 5.5 feet in diameter when you, when you do the math. Okay, now that we know what a Megillah looks like, let's move on. Zechariah is going to go on to describe a woman, or an Isha, that's the Hebrew for, for woman, that sits in the midst of an ephah, or in some versions they say a basket. Let's look closely at these two words and see exactly what an Isha is and exactly what an ephah is. In the Hebrew... The word Isha can mean two, two different things. It can either mean a woman, which is what most tra translations put it into the English, or the exact same word Isha can mean fire offering. It's the exact same word. And you can only tell by the context which one is, is being used here. And Apha, in some versions they call it a basket, a woman in a basket, or an Isha in, an, in a basket. But the... The word basket is actually apha. It's more precisely a receptacle for holding a quantity of 40 liters. It's a container, sometimes made of clay. Sometimes it can be a basket, uh, it, but it has a capacity to hold about 40 liters, kind of like a bushel basket kind of deal, a dry unit of measurement. The NIV and, and most other uh, modern versions just say basket. But remember, the word here is apha. When we read through this Zechariah chapter 5, we have to remember that when the Bible translators were putting this passage in English 400 years ago, the idea of a fire offering encased in lead that sat in the midst of an ephah seemed kind of weird to them. So they opted instead for a woman in a basket with a lead lid on it instead. We're going to actually see how since 1945 that this Hebrew word isha really being a firing, uh, fire offering like it means will make a lot more sense than stuffing some woman into a basket that's flying around and putting a lead lid on it because she's so evil. Uh, now that we have checked some of our Hebrew, and being that we now live in the nuclear age, we might be the first generation to actually understand this prophecy. So let's read Zechariah chapter 5 using the original Hebrew words to keep us on track here. All right. Then I turned... And lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, a flying roll, a Megillah. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying Megillah, a roll. The length thereof is twenty cubits, and the breadth thereof is ten cubits. Now, if we do the math on this, that works out to be 34.3 feet long. There's 20.6 inches per cubit. And uh, if you want to figure out the diameter, you can do the math, and it comes out to be about five and a half feet in diameter, this flying megilla. So Zachariah sees this flying roll, 34 feet long, five and a half feet wide. Basically a single cylinder, as opposed to a scroll with two rolls rolled up together. A megilla can also have various writing and markings on the sides of it, okay? All right, let's read on. Then said he unto me, this, this roll, or this megillah, is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it, and everyone that swears shall be cut off as on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, 
and it, this flying roll, shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of the house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. Okay. So far we have this 34 foot long flying Megillah that flies through the air and kills people by slamming to their houses and consuming even the stones thereof. And it leaves a residue. Okay, let's read on. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what this is that goeth forth. You see, Zechariah would have known what a Megillah was. He read them all the time. This was obviously something new to him that looked sort of like a Megillah. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. Okay, this Megillah is delivering a 40-liter container of some kind, an ephah. He said, moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. So there's more than just one of these. According to this, this is how they look throughout the entire earth. Okay? This is where it starts getting really, really interesting. And behold... There was lifted up a talent of lead. And this talent of lead that was lifted up is an Isha, not a woman, but a fire offering that sits in the midst of the Apha, the 40 liter container. So in the original Hebrew here is an Isha, a fire offering that is a round heavy weight of metal translated back in 1611 as lead, that sits in the midst of a 40-liter container. That's weird. Okay, let's read on a little more. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Okay, now this is getting scary. Zechariah is detailing the detonation of the atomic trigger of a thermonuclear warhead. In the Hiroshima fission bomb, you had two subcritical masses of fissile material that were imploded into each other using conventional explosives, which triggered a nuclear reaction. Okay, uh, A plutonium bullet was cast into the mouth thereof of a larger mass of U-235, using TNT to achieve critical mass. There's no Hebrew word for uranium-235. So the closest possible way Zachariah could have described this would have been as lead. Uranium actually turns into lead as it encounters radioactive decay. This fission device Zachariah described here itself is an atomic bomb, the likes of which is also available to be used as the atomic trigger for larger thermonuclear fusion bombs like the H-bomb. Also, nuclear warheads are typically encased in lead or beryllium to contain stray neutrons during detonation, and also protect the handlers that come close to the weapon. But that's not all. It goes on even farther. I think it's verse 9 here. Then lifted I up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, there came out two Isha fire offerings. And the wind was in their wings, for they had the wings like the wings of a stork. You ever see a stork flying? Kind of, they got that long, stretched out body. And they lifted up the Apha between the earth and the heaven. So we have these flying rolls or megillas, which are carrying up into what we call the upper atmosphere, these 40 liter containers loaded with round weights of heavy metal, which are themselves wicked fire offerings, which are going to go and kill people and consume even the stones of their houses and then leave this residue behind on top of it. If this is in fact what he saw 2,500 years ago, there is no possible way to say it more clearly in his Hebrew language. There's no way you can say that more clearly. He just described the entire mechanism of the, the whole device. So who is the one that's getting judged by these flying rolls, whatever they are? Then I said to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. 
All right. To build, that's to establish, to cause, to continue. It a house, that's actually in the Hebrew, if you look it up, that is kind of talking like it can be a house of Shoel or a house of hell. And it can be established, or it shall be established. Set up, erect, set upright, like you would set a vase upright. And set, that's uh, to lay down or deposit, actually. They're upon her own base, resting place, base. So basically what this is saying is this ephah, when it arrives to wherever it's going, its destination, it deposits the wicked fire offering there. Prophet Zachariah in particular describes what seems to be a nuclear exchange in such vivid detail, it's downright scary. He speaks of these flying cylindrical containers that deliver these wicked fire offerings composed of extremely heavy metal, which fly across the face of the whole earth and consume houses and buildings, even the stones thereof, and, uh, they, they even leave this residue behind after the destruction. Zachariah even gives the exact dimensions of the delivery vehicles, the size of the containers that hold the wicked fire offerings, and he even details exactly how the heavy metal mechanism of this evil fire offering is detonated. He identifies exactly who is targeted and even why. We also read about the judgment of the great whore of Babylon, the city that sits on seven hills and how God will cause the kings of the earth to hate her and consume her with fire until she will be found no more at all forever. The scriptures do seem to have a lot to say about this coming fire judgment. So who is the one that's getting judged by these flying rolls? Then I said to the angel that talked with me, 
Whither do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, To build it a house in the land of Shinar. Now, uh, it's going to build it a house in the land of Shinar. What's that talking about? Literal Shinar, or Babylon, That's another is, is in present-day Iraq. Shinar is Babylon. After reading the terrifying account in Ezekiel 38 and 39 about the coming war that in that region, it, it's fair to say that this war includes the Middle East. However, from, from other passages, I really don't think you can just limit it to that region alone. We, we know that God will destroy mystery Babylon the Great by causing the kings of the earth to utterly burn her with fire. Remember Revelation chapter 17 and 18? So what is this mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth? Well, if you read Revelation, she's that great city which is drunken with the blood of the saints. She reigns over the kings of the earth and she sits upon the seven hills. Okay? You need to read Revelation 17 and 18 for more detail on that. So Zechariah here is just saying this, built, this, this uh, wicked fire offering judgment is going to the land of Shinar. You know, Zechariah 5, along with many other scriptures, indicate that this fire judgment will be worldwide. Zechariah said earlier that this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth, not just literal Iraq, Babylon, or Shinar. God says that he will bring it forth and judge all of those who swear falsely by his name. Okay, now who could that be? Who swears by the name of God in the first place? Muslims? No, they don't swear by the name of that God. Hindus? Nope, they don't swear by the name of that God. Buddhists? Nope. Wiccans? No. Christians and Jews are the only ones who can swear falsely by his name. The scriptures describe the religious system of Babylon the Great as being the mother of harlots, the religious system that is the mother of all adultery against God. There are also all the other daughter harlots as well who swear falsely by his name. You got to read through Revelation 17 and 18 here. Messiah himself talked about how on the day of judgment, there will be multitudes of people claiming they did all these great works in his name, but he has to turn them away because he never really actually knew them. You know, 
being religious in the sight of men and really loving God with all your heart are two separate things. This particular judgment mentioned here in Zechariah 5 is actually God's judgment on those who swear falsely by his name and those who stealeth, it says also. That would include many, 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 many of us all across the earth. Babylon is not just in Shinar anymore. Its borders have long ago spilled over the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The kingdom of Babylon the Great now saturates the entire earth. And as Zachariah describes, this curse of fire will cover all the earth as well. Sure, the mother may reside on the city of seven hills, but the daughter harlots are guilty of fornication as well. There is no protection from this curse in the loyalty to any denomination. You have to bear the mark of the Lord in your minds and on your right hands and in your hearts to be spared from this one. If you choose to really love and follow him alone, Yahweh will lead you not into temptation, but will deliver you from evil. Peace be with you all.